good to be with you all this morning. As I mentioned um, in that little interview, I work in IT, which grants the fact that I'm not handy in any way. Um, but being a, a young dad, I feel like I have to grow into that stereotype, you know, like getting handy around the house, doing renovations, fixing up, you know, bits and bobs around the house, but alas, I'm not that great at it. Um, and so what I do is I, I like to watch videos on, you know, home renovations, home transformations. Um, and so I watch it and I, I look at all these different projects, right? And I, I, I've boiled it down to two, to two different sort of renos. One is just a renovation, right? Where they, you know, fix up the paint a little bit. They, they change the furniture and, you know, but it, it still looks like the same house. Um, but then there are these projects where it, they've completely transformed the inside of the house. So when they do that little before and after shot, I'll turn to Renee, I'll be like, wow, that looks like a completely different house. And then that's when I start saying to her, you know, maybe we'll try to put exposed beams or put lead lighting. But then I just remember that I don't know how to do any of those things. <laughs> No, <laughs> and I think COVID hasn't helped, right? When you, you try to do all these things in your spare time. But anyway, like as we've read in our passage today, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter four. And the passage that we'll be looking at today describes a transformation that occurs in every believer when we come to faith in Jesus Christ and, and the necessary lifestyle change that it brings. But if you follow the Bible reading, if you followed it, you would notice that we've been dropped straight into an imperative. We've been dropped straight into a command or an instruction. So I tell you this and insisted on the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Now, if you take that at face value, especially the imperatives that have been given um, in, that, in the last part of that passage or in that text, from verses 29 onwards, where it says, you know, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, or don't grieve the Holy Spirit, or further back up, like don't be angry. You will begin to quickly realize that these are things that still have a grip in our lives. And if you're anything like me, we, we recognize the affinity that we have to sin. But it's helpful to remember, and I want to take some time to unpack this for us, it's that for every imperative or command found in Scripture, that is, what we are meant to do for God, rests on the indicative. That is, who we are based on what God has done for us. And that order is not reversible. That is the essence of the Christian faith. In other words, what Christians do is based on who we are in Christ and, Christ and what Christ has done for us, right? We love God because he first loved us. That's the, that's the principle. And it's helpful to note that the letter of Ephesians, or the letter wrote to the Ephesian church, is divided into two sections, or two logical sections. Chapters 1 to 3 deals with the theology of our salvation, what God has done for us historically. And chapters 46 deals with the implications. What are we meant to do because of what God has done for us. So before we tackle the imperatives in our text, let's briefly look at what we were like before God stepped in to save us. So turn with me to chapter two, chapter two, verse one. And here we see an insight on who we were before Christ saved us, or before God saved us. Verse one, it says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. This is who we were. Before we became Christians, before we came to faith in Christ, we were dead in trespasses, dead in transgressions and sins. We were dead. We weren't unconscious. We weren't merely sick. We weren't merely slightly incapable of choosing God. We were completely, totally incapable of choosing God. This may be offensive to some, but this is what makes the gospel even more glorious, does it not? We were totally lost, totally incapable of choosing righteousness, just as a dead person can't choose to breathe, so was our ability to choose Christ. And it's a sobering reminder, isn't it, of who we were 
before Christ came. Verse 2, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So we lived our lives doing two things. One, we followed the ways of this world, all the values, all the trends, all the ideologies that the world embraced apart from Christ. We embrace these things. And secondly, we followed the ruler of the kingdom of the air, which is Satan. And Satan being opposed to God, his spirit contrasted with the spirit of God that indwells Christian is now at work through everyone who rejects God. And these people are called, as some translations render it, the sons of disobedience. And verse 3. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. And as a result of our sinful nature and our rebellious lifestyle against God, we were destined for God's wrath. We were by nature deserving of wrath. So this is who we were. We were dead in our trespasses, transgressions and our sins. We followed the ways of this world. We were led by the spirit of the devil. We gratified the desires of our flesh. But now we come to that great intervention in verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, in the translation that I grew up reading, the, the good old King James Version, it merely says, but God, but God, not because of you, but God, in the richness of his mercy and his great love, despite our past condition of being dead in our trespasses and sins, while we were yet sinners, while we were living in opposition to God, God made us alive. Verse 5. God made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So God made us alive. God saved us. And how did he do this? Through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Turn with me to chapter 1 and verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. And if you look in verse 13, it says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And now that we are saved, we are no longer separated from Christ. We are no longer outside of Christ, but we are now in Christ. And this phrase repeats itself time and time again in this beautiful letter. In Christ, you are no longer outside of Christ, but in Christ. And because we are now in Christ, we have been given all these blessings and benefits. Turn back to chapter 2, verse 6. What has God done for us? He's raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So we have been elevated from sinner to saint, from outcast to friend, from an orphan to a son and a daughter. We were far away from God, but God has brought us near to himself so that we can draw near to God himself. And all this was done, as verse 7 says, so that God might show us his kindness through Christ Jesus, the immeasurable, incomparable riches or extent of his grace. And it is by this same amazing grace that we have been saved through faith, and that is not of our own doing, it is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. So salvation is God's gift to us. There is nothing that we brought to the table but our sin. It's kind of like in, in university, right, where you have these group, group exercises or group assignments. There's always this one person who contributes nothing, and you just leech off the other people who work. That, that, that was who we were. We brought nothing to the table but our sin. Jesus 
God, the Spirit, did everything for us. And this was the story of the Ephesians. And if you are a Christian, this is your story too. Dead in our sins, incapable of choosing God, our thinking was futile, our hearts were hardened towards God. But God intervened by his grace and mercy, not by any work that we had done, but through God's own volition, God's own will, he gives us saving faith and makes us alive in Jesus Christ. How amazing is that? When God saved us, he took our hardened heart and replaces it with a heart of flesh, one that responds to spiritual truths, one that cares for spiritual things, one that desires, most importantly, to please God and to live holy lives. Carrying on from that illustration earlier, when God saved us, he didn't merely renovate our lives. He didn't just put in a new coat of paint, a new set of morals, a new set of goodness. He completely transforms our lives, strips it from the inside out, and gives us a new heart, a new set of desires, a new purpose, a new trajectory in life. Nothing inside is left unturned. The, the outside may still look the same. The facade is still the same. But inside, when people speak to you, when people come across you, your paths, they'll notice that something drastically has changed. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new Creature, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, this is what happens when someone is born again. When someone is, as Paul says, regenerated, made alive. We have been given new life, completely transformed. But that's not where the goodness of God ends, even though that would have been far more than we deserve. God could have just saved us and, and left us there, and he would have been, and that would have been far more than we deserve. God could have done the saving and left it at that. He could have said, I've done my part, now it's up to you. Now it's up to you to maintain your salvation, up to you to continue that good work that I began. But God didn't leave us there. He didn't leave us there. God himself seals or secures our salvation by his spirit. Turn back to chapter 1, verse 13. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So God saved you. When he made you alive in Christ, he himself seals your salvation, not by your works, not by anything that we have done, but by the Spirit. God himself becomes the deposit that guarantees our final salvation. And so he saved us. He has sealed us by the Spirit. But that's not where God stops. God didn't stop there. Look with me in chapter 2, verse 10, continuing this thought of what God has done for us in Christ. Verse 10, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So no longer as are we objects of wrath, as Paul puts in, in Romans, but we have become God's handiwork. We are his workmanship. The picture here is of a craftsman fashioning an object for a specific purpose. And, and what has God created us to do? What, what is our purpose? To do good works. But here's the amazing part. Just as sure as our salvation is because God is the one who wrought or brought about salvation in our lives, so is our sanctification. 
So is this ability to grow in holiness, to grow in our good works. That's what Paul meant when he wrote, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The the thought of God predestining our sanctification is in play here. So in other words, a Christian will bear fruit. A Christian will grow in holiness. Salvation that doesn't bring about sanctification in one's life is not salvation. Sanctification must occur because God prepared in advance for us to walk in good works. So good works, holiness, sanctification is a part of God's saving work in our lives. And so when we jump into chapter 4 of the book of Ephesians, and considering what God has done for us, considering that God has given us everything that we need in order to please him, in that he saved us, he's, he's sealed us, he's sanctified us, and he continues to help us in this endeavor, this command to no longer walk or to live as the Gentiles lived doesn't seem so unreasonable, doesn't it? And in fact, in chapter 4, verse 1, Paul urges the church to live a life worthy of the calling that they have received. This exhortation, this command, no longer becomes unreasonable. It actually becomes our reasonable response. It becomes our reasonable worship. As Paul puts it in Romans 12, 1, Therefore I urge you, in view of God's mercy, in light of what God has done for us, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship, or it is our reasonable service. So Paul, in the same way, exhorts the Ephesian church, abandon Abandon your old way of living. I tell you this, and by heavenly authority, I insisted on the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Why? Because that is the old you. And here Paul begins to stress the difference between their old way of life and the new that has come. Look with me in verses 17 to 19. So I tell you this and insisted on the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding, separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That was the old Jew. The old Jew sought foolishly for things that would satisfy. You know, the world keeps coming up with new things for us to to latch on to with the promise that this will satisfy you. This will give you satisfaction and purpose in your life. But people go and, and take that bait, but then they come out the other side wanting You were blinded by sin. Your your understanding and your perception of life was darkened so much so that it prohibited you from seeing the truth, making you ignorant, causing you to harden your heart. And because of this, it alienates you from the life which God gives. But not only did we have heart issues, these issues that are occurring in our hearts starts to come out in the way that we lived. Verse 19, you have become so callous in your sin, that we have let ourselves go to sensuality and lewd behavior, greedy to practice every kind of impurity, our life was marked by unrestraint. That was the old you. Don't go back to that. Don't return to your old lifestyle. Why? Verse 20. You, however, did not come to know about Christ that way. Another way to translate this is, but that is not the way you learned Christ. Not about Christ, learned 
Christ. And this is the only time Paul uses this expression in any of his writing. It's unique. And, and some have argued that Paul uses this to heighten the centrality of Jesus Christ to Christianity and the teachings of Jesus to Christianity. So in other words, a Christianity that possesses no resemblance of Christ's teaching is not Christianity. And there are so many forms of Christianity these days that disguises itself as Christianity, but it bears no resemblance to the holiness and to the life that Jesus urges us to live. As the commentator puts it, learning Christ means welcoming him as a living person and being shaped by his teachings. Now in verse 21, Paul does something interesting here. And in in the NIV, he doesn't bring it out as much, but he introduces a conditional statement. Verse 21, when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus... Now, other translations render this as assuming that you have heard about him, or if indeed you have heard of him. Paul's saying, let's assume this. If you have heard of him and you have been taught by him according to the truth that is in Jesus, since Jesus himself is the truth, then you would know two things to be true. Now, firstly and implicitly, that the lifestyle of the Gentiles that I've just mentioned was not the lifestyle that Jesus promoted or the truth that he taught. It's impossible. It's incompatible. But secondly, Jesus, through the gospel and the authority that he gave the apostles, taught to do three things in relation to your old life. Firstly, we are to put off our old self. We are to put off every incense, everything that carried, that we carried over from our old self, we are to put that off. We are to renew our mind and we are to put on the new self. Verse 22. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Since you have learned Jesus, since you have now a new identity in Christ, you must put off or get rid of every corrupt practice that was part of your former life. I've heard that as babies grow older, as they learn to hold food and play around by themselves, their clothes are going to start to get more and more dirty. The washing machine will get more use and we'll need to buy more clothes, or <laughs> so I've heard. And so what are we to do when that happens? We are to take off their old clothes, put new clothes on. Now this term, putting off your old life or your old self, that's exactly the picture it's trying to paint. We are to put off these old clothes that we carried over from our old self because our identity is no longer tied to our old Self And here we'll quickly begin to realize a fundamental pillar of the Christian life, and that is repentance. Repentance. No, we have already been saved by God from the penalty of sin. We have been saved by God from the power of sin. But we're still waiting for that final deliverance from the presence of Of sin. And until that happens, here's the reality, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, but we are still at war with indwelling sin. Hence why we need this reminder, don't we? But our lives should be marked with a continual repentance, a continual putting off of our old self, our sinful nature, Anything in our lifestyle that doesn't please God, the evil desires that mark our lives, these should be continually put off. This is part of our sanctification. And to continue the metaphor of, the, of a house transformation, and, you know, some of these videos, the before uh, video, you know, the houses were like bombs. 
The garage was stocked. It was full of rubbish. So much so that they've had to create or to build a shed in the back. And then they'd put their rubbish there as well. And I had an uncle who had a knack for driving every weekend, looking for the council pickup and getting out of the car and looking at some old treadmill or some old whatever knickknack. And he'll be like, I reckon I can fix this. And so he'll take that home and he'll bring it back to the dismay of my auntie. <laughs> but that's pretty much sometimes how we live. You know, we, we've been set free from sin, from the power of sin. We've put off some foolish, sinful behaviors, but we still have a tendency, don't we, to bring them back, to bring them back in. Hence the reminder to put off, put off. Look with me in verses 25 to 32. These are the things that we're still prone to, right? We're still prone to to lying. We're still prone to get angry. We may have an urge to steal. Unwholesome words that aren't pleasing to God still comes out from our mouths. And this isn't just restricted to one certain generation, but it happens until God brings us home. We still tear down people instead of building them up. We still grieve the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit who seals us. We still get bitter, don't we? But what Paul is saying here is we don't have to. We're not enslaved to these sinful behaviors because Christ saved us, right? And he's changed us. He's given us a new identity, He helps us in our holiness. It means that we can speak truth. We can resist the devil and not give him the opportunity to tempt us. We don't have to be angry. We don't have to keep stealing. But instead, we can work so we can share with those in need. We can use our words to build up. We can please God. We can get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, and wickedness. We can be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. In other words, we can put off our old self, but there is work that needs to be done. Look with me in verse 23. We are to be made new in the attitude of our minds. Or another way to read this is to renew our minds by the Spirit. Well, in Ephesians 3.16, Paul prays that they may be strengthened through his Spirit in the inner being. The Holy Spirit is always the agent of change in a believer's life. Now, but what does it mean to renew our, our attitudes by the Spirit? Well, to put simply... It means to saturate your minds, the mind being the center of thought, understanding, belief, motive, action with the word of God. Colossians 3.16 urges us to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly so that the word of God will begin to shape your thought, understanding, belief, motive, and action so that we can be changed from one degree of glory to another by the Spirit. Now, the danger of not doing this is found in Galatians 5. You know, it's, it's written in a positive, but in, in a negative sense, if we do not walk by the Spirit, we will gratify. We will fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So the question is, what is... Are we allowing to saturate our minds? Now, these days, you will agree with me that there are so many things that vies for our affection, that vies for our attention. There's hardly a place where we are not not entertained. We have devices of every size, It can be handheld, it can be held with two hands, it can be looked at sitting down, 
you know, entertainment is, is everywhere. And it's so easy to let our minds be filled with things other than the Word of God. And it, by, um, by logic, then our attitudes then will be shaped by what we allow into our minds. And so the question is, what is dwelling in us richly? Is it the Word of Christ or is it anything else that isn't the Word of Christ? Are we renewing our minds? Are our lives being continually transformed by the Word of God? Number three, verse 24, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So as a consequence of the first imperative, to put off your old self, your old identity, you are to put on your new self based on the salvation that we have in Christ. Now to be sure, we have been new. When, when we trusted in Christ, we have been made new. The moment we became Christians, we came to faith, we became a new creation. Not a renovated creation, but a completely new, transformed creation. The old and the former things have passed. But what Paul is saying here is that we need to continue living in light of that reality and to continue living our lives based on a new set of values, holiness and righteousness. And as a result of their new reality, that upon their conversion, they have been created after the likeness of God. And so Paul contrasts them to someone who lived as a Gentile versus someone who is now alive in Christ, who has put on this new self. And so a question that we need to ask ourselves is, have we experienced this change? Have we experienced this radical transformation in our lives where we no longer strive or pursue worldly pursuits and, and worldly goals and thinking that that is the purpose of our life? Has he changed us? So now we, we seek after holiness. We seek after the things of God. Because you are either in Christ or you are outside of Christ. You are either a child of God, trusting in Jesus alone for salvation and saved from the penalty of sin, or you are a child of disobedience, rejecting Jesus' offer of salvation and destined for eternal punishment? Are you relying on your goodness? Are you relying on your morality for acceptance in Christ Jesus? But we need to be reminded that that will never be enough. Our good works are as filthy rags compared to the holiness of Jesus Christ which is why God saw it fit to send Jesus here on earth to take on the form of a servant, to bear our sins because he, unlike our first father Adam, so that he could do what he could not, live a perfect life, and then to offer his life as a ransom, as a substitute for us, so that when we trust in him and the work that he has done on the cross, we can have salvation in Jesus Christ alone. So don't wait any longer. Turn from your sin and trust Christ. And lastly, our new identity in Christ necessitates a change in the way that we live. You know, the new self that we have, our new identity, is created like God holy and righteous. And so to live like unbelievers in unrighteousness and impurity is utterly inconsistent with who we are now in Christ. Romans 6.6 6 says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, 
so that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. But we struggle, don't we? We struggle with sin. Our, our lives are, are marked with ups and downs. We have seasons of spiritual highs and spiritual lows, of strengths and, and weaknesses. But we can be thankful to God that he knows this. He understands this. And that's one of the reasons why God condescended to us so that he will understand what it feels like to be tempted as a man, but yet without sin. And to live an example, an example for us to follow. A few weeks ago, or a few months ago now, I was able to speak on the, um, the account of Jesus uh, in, in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was praying. And he sets for us an example of what it's like or how we ought to handle our temptations. And we see the contrast there between the disciples and, and Jesus, God himself, in that moment of, of temptation. What was he doing? He was praying. And he urged the disciples to watch, to, to be prayerful, to be vigilant. What did disciples do? They were asleep. And, and that points to us that sometimes we have the tendency to rely on our own strength to fight temptation. But that is the exact reason why God gave us the Spirit, because without the Spirit, we cannot please God. Apart from God, we cannot please Him. So God knows that we still have indwelling sin. And, and when we do fail as Christians, it doesn't speak to a deficiency on God's part, but it speaks on our overconfidence in our own strength. But what is hopeful and, and something that we must always point back to is that we have everything that we need to live a life of godliness. He's given us this spirit. He's given us the word. And earlier in this chapter, he's given us pastors, teachers, evangelists, and historically prophets, apostles, to build us up so that we may come to maturity of the faith, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So God has not left us unattended. He's given us everything that we need. We can find victory over the impulses of our sinful nature because God himself is our helper. God himself helps us with our sanctification. And when we do stray, we can find forgiveness in Christ. His mercies are new every morning. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And our sanctification is not marked by the complete lack of sin in our lives, but it is marked with a growing total dependency on God for the pursuit of Christ-likeness. So, out with the old and on with the new, so that we can say, as Paul, say, as Paul says in Galatians 2.20, it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Let's pray. Father, such precious truths. Help us, Lord, to not grow weary in reminding ourselves of what you have done for us. And as we reflect on these truths that should be common, or if it's not common, then if it's new, Lord, help us to reflect on it and may it propel us to service. May it propel us to, to worship you, not just on Sundays, but in every day of our lives and in everything that we do and say. In Jesus' name, amen.